Welcome, Mr. Stefan Dukon. Uh, welcome to the audience of Asia Research Network. Uh, whenever we have Beijing Forum, we invite a couple of renowned scholars for interviews. So it is my pleasure to have yes, and one minute intensive interview. It's <laughs> definitely my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Development economics and China, Asia, and so on. Okay. Uh, would you briefly? Uh, Tell us the, uh, the background also. What is your motivation for studying so-called developed economics? All right. So, um, well, the motivation is easy. You know, there's this still uh, a lot of people, a lot of countries that um, are not having very high incomes where basic conditions are quite limited. So my own motivation has always been quite simple. I find it both very important but also very fascinating to try to think about what can be done to get some of the poorest people and some of the poorest countries at a better level of development and a better standard of living. Um, in my case, it's been that in fact, ever since the late 1980s, I go back a long time, uh, mm -hmm. I've been studying Africa, mm -hmm. um, different countries and their conditions and what can be done to, to improve uh, their um, conditions and their living conditions in the country. Mm -hmm. Any special reason you somehow, you know, the uh, focused on Africa? Is it related to something so-called uh, colonial origin or something related to white men's burdens? What? Oh, um, I think it's simpler. Yeah. Um, in my own assessment a long time ago, as a very young scholar, um, when I joined the university to do my PhD, I asked myself, um, you know, which countries uh, probably could do still most with outside scholars trying to mm -hmm. think and work about it uh -huh. and I think even by then definitely Latin America had plenty of good scholars mm -hmm. I think Asia had by then already lots of good scholars and I think mm -hmm. there was still work to be done in Africa um, mm -hmm. in fact my very first job after mm -hmm. my PhD became uh, I became a visiting professor in Addis Ababa University uh -huh. teaching mm -hmm. students there and still this mm -hmm. is Ethiopia is the country mm -hmm that I have the long link. So I thought there's still some work to be done. There's also from a research point of view, under-researched using modern methods. So I was quite happy to work on Africa in general. After spending you know, the long, very uh, colorful career as economist, you decide to jump onto some real world. <laughs> yes. Government, right? So could you That's tell great. us a little yes. bit? So you know, I've, I've been, uh, I'm one of these people who I never set out to be an academic, but somehow mm -hmm. stumbled into it. I, I ended up enjoying uh, thinking about these countries and I enjoyed doing research and I gradually you know, got offered academic positions and I made progress. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a really amazing thing to be able to think freely and to work freely. But I think once in a while as an academic, it, it is worthwhile to think about are the things that I'm doing at all relevant for those who are trying to do something about the problems you're studying. And when I was offered the opportunity to serve in government mm -hmm. in the UK, uh, I was definitely very happy to do this. So I've been now for the last four years the chief economist of the Department for International Development, which is essentially the government department in the UK that's responsible for aid and for development mm -hmm. and that brings uh, gives me the opportunity to mm -hmm. apply uh, all the thinking and the mm -hmm. thoughts that I me and my colleagues have been done mm -hmm. while at the same time working with highly motivated uh, people who are actually trying to make the world a better place mm -hmm. so I'm I've been enjoying it very thoroughly and I hope I'm useful as well well you mentioned aid and development when you uh, look at the global map, uh, a lot of people is uh, making argument despite years and years of aid, but you don't see any, any single country uh, could really you know, develop uh, from very stark situations simply based on aid. Sure. So is it telling the aid has been so much a futile attempt? No, I mean in the, in the, in the the bigger scheme of things, aid always played only a small part. Mm -hmm. It's played a small part only in Chinese development. It's mm -hmm. played 
a relatively small part in what India has been doing, what other Asian countries have been doing. But that's not the same as saying that it never played any useful role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think um, aid is just one little piece, which is just, an, in the end, financial resources mm -hmm. possibly coming together with some expertise from other countries mm -hmm. to actually contribute to this to development puzzles. But we've learned a long time ago that uh, a lot of things that have nothing to do with aid, such mm -hmm. as trade policies, mm -hmm. such as um, global deals on um, on to do with conflict and global stability and peace and so on, mm -hmm. have at least as big a role, if not a far bigger role, to mm -hmm. play in allowing countries to develop. Mm -hmm. But financial resources are still scarce in the world, so being able to complement all these non-aid type of interventions and actions with some financial resources allows countries possibly to go a little bit faster mm -hmm. than they otherwise would have done. And I do think there's a lot of countries in the world that have managed to make progress in the region here in, say, the last decade or two decades, you know, even China was developing overseas, de uh, receiving overseas development assistance, and it has been using it very effectively. Mm -hmm. um, Vietnam is a country that has received a lot of aid and has been using it very well. And in that sense, it, it can help countries to go a little bit faster. But mm -hmm. I'm the last one to say that mm -hmm. aid is the solution for development. Mm -hmm. It has a lot more to do with all the other things that need to be in place so that economies can develop, that states are stable, that they provide a good source for investment for, uh, for firms and so on. And aid only plays a small part of it. But I do think it can be useful and I hope that we can from the UK, for example, use our aid effectively and efficiently so that we can help countries to go a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we can uh, delve into this question just a little bit further. People are just saying that, you know, instead of giving poor people a okay, fish, but mm. you better, you know, teach them how to, you know, catch a fish. But when you see the people simply, you know, the concern about their day in and day out, instead of uh, teaching them how to catch a fish, giving fish is more easy way, even more humanitarian way. Sure. But the question is, you know, how you can make linkage. So at which point okay, you, you can move from simply giving fish uh, into the point of, you know, teaching them how to catch a fish? Well, um, an awful lot of, of the resources that are given in aid are actually given in education, mm -hmm. are in skills training, are in providing this kind of issues. It's, it would be very naive to simply say that the only thing that aid does is in the form of humanitarian aid, food aid, or some handouts. There is actually a very small amount of aid that actually is given like this. Most of the aid in the world is given to institutions that try to set up, for example, good health systems, good education systems, and yes, pay some money for this. To take the analogy of the fish again, mm -hmm. you need to have a bit of money to be able to buy the fish nets <laughs> and to get some of the investment going. But just giving the fish nets doesn't mean that they know how to fish, yeah. nor will you then create as conditions where the son of the fisherman will also want to invest in more fishing nets. Mm -hmm. And I think all these things matter. Create, well, offer some of the capital, the resources that can be used. Create the conditions that it's worthwhile to teach that people themselves get better skills to, to learn to how to fish better. Um, and indeed, create the conditions that other people come in and put their own private money into fishing mm -hmm. and to create investment in the countries to actually make them grow. Mm -hmm. So again, I think it's a misrepresentation that this is just handouts mm -hmm. to governments for that they can do what they want with it. Mm -hmm. We're all committed to try to use the aid in such a way that it actually is an investment in the country mm -hmm. and not just something that is mm -hmm. given to consume some more fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, despite you know, more than a half century of giving aid to Africa and some other simply a poor country, why somehow, you know, the global community uh, failed to see uh, some critical mass of those countries oh. uh, changing from that uh, consistently uh, on receiving end 
to some you know next stage. Well, is it related institutions or corruptions? Oh yes. So there are definitely all these factors. But we should we shouldn't be too negative also about Africa in general. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you look at indicators such as health indicators, mm -hmm. education indicators, mm -hmm. they are far better now than they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, Africa has made massive progress in infant mortality. It's more than half mm -hmm. over the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, Education enrollment has increased tremendously. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's, uh, when I started working in Ethiopia, uh, the enrollment rate was mm -hmm. less than 20% of the children in okay. the country went to school. Now I mean, it's primary reached school. primary oh, school, yeah. and now it's more than 80%. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not going to say aid did this, but mm -hmm. Ethiopia is an example where the government used the aid that came quite effectively and boosted uh, enrollment quite dramatically, and it's boosting the quality of education at the moment as well. So we can do things. But you're absolutely right. Um, there, is, there are definitely countries where, despite aid, very little has happened. I am one of the people that always uh, tells my colleagues to be very careful about the negative impacts of aid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, when you're giving to a country aid, you're creating incentives for the country not to look for the money themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you start with negative incentives. Mm -hmm. That does mean that you really have to work very hard to turn these negative incentives mm -hmm. into something positive. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are working in countries, of which unfortunately there are quite a few in Africa, where the politics of the country is such mm -hmm. that those who are in power, the elite that is in power, mm -hmm. doesn't really care about mm -hmm. growth and development, mm -hmm then actually, whatever aid we give, it is very hard to get a positive return. We may be able to help some children to go to school, to give a bit of health, but we're not creating the conditions mm -hmm. where even the people from the country itself mm -hmm. will invest in their own country, mm -hmm. which is what's needed. Mm -hmm. Economic development mm -hmm. will not take place. Mm -hmm. We have too many countries in Africa where mm -hmm. money gets made, including from aid, and that ends up in bank accounts abroad. Mm -hmm. And they're not even investing it in the mm -hmm. country. And I think that's one of the lessons I think I, mm -hmm. these days I try to bring from Asia into mm -hmm. Africa, mm -hmm. that one of the important parts mm -hmm. of development to be successful mm -hmm. is that you need a political elite mm -hmm. from whatever system they come. Mm -hmm. But the political elite fundamentally mm -hmm. must be committed mm -hmm. to try to get growth and development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the striking mm -hmm. thing that we can see across political systems in East Asia, mm -hmm. that actually many of these countries, even if they had different, more capitalist economies, more controlled economies, but you had leadership mm -hmm. that fundamentally wanted the country to mm -hmm. succeed in development. Mm -hmm. It's not enough, but it's a necessary, necessary condition. condition yeah. And we've unfortunately, we have some countries in Africa, and that's definitely countries where we have leadership, where they really are trying now mm -hmm. to go on a developmental route. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we have others mm -hmm. where the elite mm -hmm. is just more interested mm -hmm. in, well, as you suggested, lining their own pockets, mm -hmm. where corruption is endemic, mm -hmm. where even conflict starts breaking out because mm -hmm. people want to control natural resources mm -hmm. and others. Mm -hmm. And that's not a place mm -hmm. where you can go to mm -hmm. development. Our aid in these countries can maybe help to get some more children to school, get a bit of health, and maybe it's still worthwhile doing. But it is not helping necessarily mm -hmm. to create the conditions mm -hmm. for long-term growth. Mm -hmm. It's helping a little bit. It's necessary mm -hmm. to have healthy populations mm -hmm. and educated mm -hmm. populations, mm -hmm. but it's definitely not mm -hmm. sufficient. And we need much more attention to how can we incentivize countries mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to not just use the aid well in a particular project, but to actually have a bigger vision mm -hmm. for economic development mm -hmm. in their countries mm -hmm. so that actually also our aid mm -hmm. and maybe also Asian investment can have a much better return mm -hmm. for development. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some African country uh, which you may uh, look forward to some further possibility on you know, good scoring board while others may fall in behind. What are those some countries? <laughs> well, I, I, I have to be careful. Politically, I have to be careful. But I will talk. No, I will talk. 
Look, mm -hmm. I think that in all countries there are some opportunities, mm -hmm. but there are clear countries where they have resolved these differences about the direction and the way the elite is committed to growth and development much better than others. If I compare, for example, countries with a lot of natural resources, mm -hmm. there are a lot of them in Africa now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there is a huge difference between how well natural resources mm -hmm. have been handled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we cannot deny that mm -hmm. Botswana mm -hmm. has done this far better yeah. than, for example, Nigeria. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nigeria has lost many times the mm -hmm. opportunity of mm -hmm. high oil prices mm -hmm. to actually use higher revenue from oil to really start development. Mm -hmm. Botswana has used its diamond wealth quite well. It's not a country without problems, uh, problems but it has done this well. Mm -hmm. If I go in other kinds of countries, say go to East Africa, mm. I do think that a country I know well, Ethiopia, I have been very impressed with. Mm. I've been working on Ethiopia now for 25 yeah, years. Yeah, you work a lot on Ethiopia. And I was, it's a country I know a lot about mm. and I've worked a lot about. I was very skeptical mm. in the beginning of the 1990s mm -hmm. whether they would be successful. I was actually very s skeptical that President Melis, uh, Prime Minister Melissanawi mm -hmm. was going to be successful in 2005 when they embarked on their big uh, growth and transformation plan. I was a voice that said, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. I've been very impressed by how they've really tried as well as they could within very difficult circumstances to make the necessary investment but essentially create attempting at least to create an investment climate mm -hmm. that now foreign firms mm -hmm. from Asia, from Korea, from mm -hmm. China, from uh, Japan, from uh, India are now settling into these, uh, into Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. They're not out of the woods yet. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily going to work, but I think it's, it's impressive what they came for. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia was a country. Some of my friends, historians on Ethiopia, they joke sometimes and mm -hmm. say, Ethiopia has never had a peaceful transition of power since mm -hmm. the 17th century. <laughs> so, and mm -hmm. it's a country we know of a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Prime Minister Meles, he died not so long ago. There is a bit of a transition taking place. Yes, it's within the same movement, within the same party, but it is still peaceful. Mm -hmm. And thinking that even in the 1980s, mm. this was a country at war mm. and fighting really a lot. It was fighting a war with Eritrea only 15 years ago. But it's managed within its border to keep a, a certain stability mm. and is doing something mm. for growth and development. Mm. I think actually it's mm. one of the most Asian mm -hmm. of African states. Mm. Mm. And I think, and it's a lot to do with the fundamental commitment of those who have the power mm -hmm. to say, well, we want to achieve progress in growth, progress in poverty alleviation, progress in development. Mm -hmm. So that's a country. There's others as well. Uganda has done quite well. Mm -hmm. It has its problems. Rwanda has done quite well, has its problems. Ghana, interesting place, I think. These are the kind of countries that I'm quite hopeful mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. because they have actually managed to contain conflict or overcome conflict and create at least some kind of conditions for development mm -hmm. that, uh, that are attractive. They have different political mm -hmm. systems. All of them are different, mm -hmm. the ones I've mentioned. But it is, mm -hmm. it is, it are countries that, or they are countries that where I think if I'm an investor, mm -hmm. I would start looking seriously at uh -huh. and say, mm -hmm. these are opportunities mm -hmm. and much better than 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm positive about these countries. That's good to hear. As you're aware, Korea has turned around in time scope of half a century uh, from a country which is receiving aid to the country which is giving aid, become a member of that. Uh, so in this regard, Eva University I'm teaching, I have many African students, and especially those Ethiopian students, as you know, Ethiopia sent uh, their soldiers to fight Korean War. And history is moving on, mm. and uh, many years later, so the, my students, her father, who actually come to Korea to fight. Right. And now she's speaking Korean, and oh. Korea is giving aid. So <laughs> that is a remarkable turnaround. Right. And since you mentioned uh, Asia's role, perhaps you can uh, talk a lot. Uh, first of all, 
uh, even though uh, Asia is uh, growing by leaps and bounds, but giving aid is relatively new, new experience for Asian community, especially Korea. But China is also very you know, actively and aggressively uh, utilizing aid. And one of ongoing uh, controversy on Chinese aid on Africa is you're quite aware, right? So uh, how, how, how do you see uh, that kind of you know, very proactive, aggressive aid, but trying mm. to utilize some other you know, the international Palace, well, you know, to start with, um, what I think Asia has to offer Africa is fundamentally, I think, in the first instant investment. Mm. I think aid, it's good that it's coming as well, that Korea gives it, that China is thinking about better ways of doing this. I think that's very good. But I, I would say what, what, what Africa really needs from Asia mm -hmm. is a little bit of its labor-intensive industries uh -huh. <laughs> to come to Africa. That's Africa right. needs yes. jobs, yes. Africa yes. needs development. Mm -hmm. So I would be very much in favor of a, of a coherent model that, br that helps uh, countries in Africa to be ready to be receiving Asian investment mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and creating the conditions mm -hmm. to make sure that this is actually good for the country, mm -hmm. that it has a high return. Mm -hmm. And then to answer your question specifically, this is still something where I think China could do better with. So China is indeed bringing quite a bit of investment. It's very involved in natural resources. It's very involved in infrastructure. At the moment, its coherence across all the different instruments, it's not very, very well done. Mm -hmm. So it may come with certain contracts, certain firms may come to Africa, mm -hmm. but there is very little attempt to coordinate mm -hmm. what it may mean for the country as a whole mm -hmm. if all these investments come in. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is, is the kind of things we're talking about mm -hmm. earlier. As you know, um, and Korea is, is, a, is a great example of it, um, you know, the it is important for investment to and for, for investment to benefit a country beyond the con the people who have the contract mm -hmm. to actually be very careful with mm -hmm. the way we do it we want to avoid um, negative consequences mm -hmm. we want to avoid corruption we want to avoid things that actually are providing negative incentives mm -hmm. on the rest of the country mm -hmm. we know that for example natural resources mm -hmm. Mm -hmm need to be handled very carefully mm -hmm. because in a lot of countries mm -hmm. if these contracts are not handled well mm -hmm. are a cause of instability mm -hmm. of corruption of all kinds of things mm -hmm. so the same with big construction uh, contracts mm -hmm. if the construction is just done because the road needs to be built to the president's mm -hmm. uh, village <laughs> yes. then it is not very helpful for mm -hmm. the country mm -hmm. so what we would like what we would like to encourage all countries to take an overall view of the relationship with countries, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which maybe for China goes a bit beyond the non-interference mm -hmm. policy that it likes to mm -hmm, have. Mm -hmm. It wants to say, well, it's just a contract. Mm -hmm. But I would say, with whom is the contract? Mm -hmm. Is the contract with the people mm -hmm. or is the contract with the leadership? Mm -hmm. And if the leadership are not necessarily have the interests of the people at mm -hmm. heart, mm -hmm. you want to be a bit more careful. Mm -hmm. So. We would like to see, mm -hmm. I don't mind a certain aggression in investment, mm -hmm. but I would like to think that they to think through more about mm -hmm. the consequences for the country as a whole, mm -hmm. for the development of the country as mm -hmm. a whole. So I have few objections in the way, for example, they do it in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. because the state is quite strong. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I think there's a fundamental commitment of the leadership to get growth and development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's things that we may disagree about, but there is the fundamental commitment. Mm -hmm. I'm more worried mm -hmm. sometimes if I go to, say, the Democratic Republic of Congo, mm -hmm. which is a little bit more tricky yeah. state. Mm -hmm. If we do mm -hmm. contracts there, surely we must be much more careful. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't sign simply a natural resource deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we're dealing with Angola, we could say, yes, we could deal with them, but let's worry a little mm -hmm. bit because this is a country that is really growing fast and it's quite rich but it's amongst the country with one of the five worst performers for infant mortality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the countryside, healthcare mm -hmm. is terrible, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so on. So we would like countries mm -hmm. that come and start joining mm -hmm. the club of giving mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. bringing also their own lessons mm -hmm. from that actually a development strategy for the whole country matters, mm -hmm. and having a dialogue with countries and trying to make sure that it's the same. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say they have to do it as we do it, as the West mm -hmm. does it. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I don't think we necessarily did it very well, mm. but we've definitely learned that actually if we don't do that, then it's, we get these cases where aid mm -hmm. and investment can actually be bad for countries. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would like mm -hmm. to avoid for the future as well. Well, uh, when you present the big case for Africa to move from current very, you know, the confused state, not all countries doing quite well, uh, better mm -hmm. than your expectations, to the next stage, uh, they need to cultivate some fertile ground for attracting investment. Yes. And from investor perspective, you mentioned that uh, stability and political security yep. uh, is going to be quite important. I think that is related to some ongoing discussion here in Beijing, here in China, that New Silk Road project, yes. New Silk Road initiative. Yeah. New Silk Road initiative, what they call One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, according to the current blueprint, they try to you know, go through more than 60 some countries. Yes. But most of those countries, without much variations, very much, you know, the euphemistically saying emerging country, yes. so very much a laid back country. So a lot of political risk. Yes. And even, obviously, this is not aid project, yes. this is not Marshall Plan. So this is kind of commercial loan, and they need to get some return out of it, right? Yes. So then, uh, when you try to link with our lesson in Africa, the development, investment, and perhaps you know, the, you must be having a lot of you know peace advice. You can give Chinese government. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think the because of course the problems I'm referring to are about the importance of good governance in the countries we work in. Mm -hmm. Of course, it applies totally for the whole uh, One Road and the Silk Road initiative. And, you know, it's a great opportunity. Infrastructure has a great potential of contributing to the pacification of countries. I, I always refer to Rome, ancient Rome, mm -hmm. built roads oh, yeah. both to do war but also to keep the peace. Right. And so there is a sense that integration mm -hmm. helps actually helps actually is, is quite a good thing, a positive thing. Mm. But, um, you know, at the same time, um, a lot can go wrong indeed. And it is clearly very important to, well, it is a risky activity as you say, there's a, there's a lot of political risk. I think the only way to overcome that is to early on to be clear mm. that the governance of this entire space, mm -hmm. that that is something important. Mm -hmm. So you can't, and this is, you, you highlight the contradiction very well, mm -hmm. you can't say, I'm going to build a road through these countries here. Mm -hmm. For these roads to be successful, I have to have peace and stability. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, other one, but meanwhile, I'll mm -hmm. treat it just as a commercial contract mm -hmm. without any interference mm -hmm. in things. Building a big road through the whole region is political. It is a political act. Mm -hmm. All aid is in some sense political. Mm -hmm. And we need to always keep on thinking about it. Mm -hmm. How can we use that politics and the political momentum that we get from it mm -hmm. to actually create the stability as well? And this sometimes will mean to be quite tough, mm -hmm. to actually be saying to have modalities mm -hmm. and to actually use your influence in the region to actually uh, make sure that you contribute to peace and stability. Mm -hmm. Again, it's very hard, you know, the West le <laughs> learns it at its peril mm -hmm. that, you know, you can't always do this. But, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a real important interaction between doing economic things and peace and stability. Mm -hmm. And they need to come together. Mm -hmm. So it does mean there needs to be that kind of political commitment mm -hmm. and the political work. Mm -hmm. And you can't do these deals for the long run with cor corrupt dictatorships, with mm -hmm. countries that are just interested in having war with other factions and so on. So you need to actually then engage mm -hmm. much more for the long run mm -hmm. for peace and stability mm -hmm. and for stable societies. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, already we you know, come into China. Uh, many people, uh, they tend to agree the fact that uh, the rise of China or well, escape from poverty of China which lifted how many? More than six, 660 yes, million yes. Uh, from absolute poverty yeah, is yeah. perhaps you know, one of the great storylines in contemporary history. Absolutely. And, but uh, without political stability, 
uh, well, that can be interpreted many different ways. Sure. But you know, uh, Chinese that they saying that where well, they have you know, one party rule, but provide very stable, you know, strong authoritarian leadership without political party, and also without you know opening toward the global community, this was never possible. Yes. And how how do you assess that kind of strong statement? <laughs> well. Um, China had history on its side mm. that, and in the sense that it is a, probably the most stable large country that ever existed yeah, in history. Huge population. There's a huge population, but also it has its, a history of a strong mm. functioning bureaucracy. This is not something that only came after 1949. Precisely. There is essentially strong state structures. Mm -hmm. I think China could turn that to its advantage mm -hmm. and the point that I mentioned earlier applies very strongly to China. It's, I, I never believe and there's very little evidence across the world that state leadership per se is a sufficient condition for development but if there is strong state leadership and this state leadership is committed to growth and development mm -hmm. then that's a good combination. Mm -hmm. And the state was strong here, with the strong state capabilities. There was a strong commitment by the leadership, mm -hmm. especially after 1979, mm -hmm. that growth and development was an important part. Mm -hmm. um, that has helped China. I think I have no problem to try to say that, you know, clearly they used the strong state that existed mm -hmm. to its advantage for development. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of other countries in the world that managed to develop mm -hmm. without having a strong centralized state. Mm -hmm. And um, there are countries that actually managed to alleviate poverty mm -hmm. at very fast rates. Mm -hmm. Country that people don't often talk about, say Bangladesh, has been mm -hmm. doing quite well in poverty reduction. Mm -hmm. This is sometimes cons considered almost a failed state. It's mm -hmm. a fragile mm -hmm. state, mm -hmm. but it has allowed non-governmental organizations, civil society actors. It has also allowed private enterprise mm -hmm. to grow textile industries and social services mm -hmm. to the benefit of people. Mm -hmm. You can have very different states mm -hmm. that actually can deliver growth mm -hmm. and that can deliver poverty reduction. Mm -hmm. so, so while I have no problem with taking the lesson for China, mm -hmm. for China, it doesn't mean that the only way to develop mm -hmm. is to have very strong state leadership mm -hmm. in the economy and everything. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think China used its history mm -hmm. to its advantage in its development. Mm -hmm. The history of a strong state has been used to its advantage for development. It's also not making a statement mm -hmm. how it will come out the next stage. It worries mm -hmm. about the middle income trap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not so clear mm -hmm. that strong central state leadership mm -hmm. is a necessary or sufficient condition mm -hmm. to keep on growing, mm -hmm. to keep on innovating your economy, mm -hmm. to keep on having mm -hmm. renewal of ideas and innovation in your economy. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Mm -hmm. That's the next stage, the next challenge they're facing. Precisely, I think yes. Korea is solving it differently. Mm -hmm. The West has solved it differently. Mm -hmm. Japan has solved it differently. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. time will tell. Mm -hmm. There is again no necessary condition that it will not work, mm -hmm. but we will have to see. Mm -hmm. But the lessons for other countries, we have to be a bit more careful. Mm -hmm. I don't think that outside East Asia, there are not many states mm -hmm. with the same strong history of state capabilities. Mm -hmm. If I take Afghanistan on the Silk Road, mm -hmm. that's not a country that is historically been strongly centralized with a strong mm -hmm. state. You're not going to build a strong state in three years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to suddenly get development via a strong centralized state. You'll have to overcome lots of other problems there as well before you can do this. Can you talk just a little bit about middle income trap, so to speak? Because whenever I go to China, any company in China, they always keep talking about the rise of China, state rise of China, a lot of projections out there. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, journal Economist, they projected sometime mid-2020, China will overtake U.S. Uh, constant GDP, already according to IMF. In it's already done, yes. Priority. <laughs> and also, you know, the, the, uh, the, the scholar like uh, Joseph Nye, uh, even if you know, China becomes the largest economy, what does that mean? It doesn't yes. mean anything. 
you know, the, it doesn't mean the greatest power country. So they're all, you know, focusing on uh, state rise of China. They don't challenge. But if you try to be more balanced about historical experience, there are only very few countries which are able to overcome the so-called middle income trap and eventually went to the older way. That's true. Perhaps Japan, yes. and Israel, Korea. Yes. I can come to only three countries. Yes. And maybe Taiwan. Uh, okay. So those very few countries. So then, uh, in that context, since you mentioned uh, China's strong uh, political uh, bureaucracy, uh, long, uh, deep-rooted history, it played a certain role. But you know, the, some people is uh, projecting it may proved to be actually negative asset. Uh, this relationship between economic development and political development. Mm -hmm. Also quite aware, still in China, we have about 70 billion mm -hmm. people still living in under poverty yes. situations, the environment problem and so on. So how do you see these kind of big questions? Well, you know, in a sense, I think the fundamental issue to look at is whether w what kind of institutional environment do you need mm -hmm. to overcome this? And I think that's where a little bit of debate has gone. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, well, the evidence shows, in the case of China, that to eliminate extreme poverty mm -hmm. and to get the country to the level where it is now, clearly the presence of the state it would be hard to argue that it was negative. It is definitely a positive role. It managed to do this, it managed to help this, and it probably faster than other countries have done so. But as you implied, this doesn't say anything about what the next part of the history is going to be. And middle income trap, we also have to be a little bit careful with mm -hmm. that, because you know, when me as an economist want to analyze carefully mm -hmm. the idea of a trap, then, then you really say it's something you can't quite overcome. Of course, compared to a lot of other middle-income countries, mm -hmm. and we're thinking here about largely North African, Middle Eastern countries, mm -hmm. as well as Latin American mm -hmm. countries, the underlying conditions in Asia mm -hmm. have been very different. Mm -hmm. And in say, the way the economies have developed mm -hmm. have allowed, it would appear, to get a structure of the economy mm -hmm. that allowed this renewal and this growth to keep on happening. So mm -hmm. Korea has mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, Singapore at some point and then Taiwan and, and so on. And uh, you, you get these economies to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but the big issue really is about what is that set of institutions you need mm -hmm. to be able to do this? And I think um, if I take, um, you know, in, in, in not so long ago, a book was published by uh, James Robinson and Darona oh, yeah. Simoglu, Why Nations mm -hmm. Fail. Yes. And it's a, it provoked an interesting question mm -hmm. because if you read that book, mm -hmm. then you say, oh, clearly China can never get out of poverty. <laughs> According to what they describe, you mm -hmm. can't say that they have the institutional setup mm -hmm. that, that, that and, and in fact the authors themselves say, oh well, uh, China doesn't have the conditions for, for growth. Now, I think the way to interpret this is that I think that they probably have it wrong in terms of the first phase of development. Mm -hmm. Clearly China, China has been successful. Yeah. But what Asimoglu and Robinson seem to suggest, which history will have mm -hmm. to test mm -hmm. is that the institutions that you have when your state is as, as centralized as it mm -hmm. is uh, that it's not entirely clear whether you will have the renewal mm -hmm. and the kind of opportunities for new entrance in the economy new entrance into politics to keep on renewing your society mm -hmm. to allow actually growth to continue mm -hmm. to take place mm -hmm. i think the institute. So, but time will tell. You know, mm. they can't prove their thesis. Mm. I know they've argued China will not get much further. Mm. I am agnostic. Mm. We'll have to see. Wait and see. Mm. We, we, let's take a long view mm. on history. But I think, and I'm sure that's what is recognized in the country here. Mm. They are in uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Countries have not thus far succeeded to go to this next mm -hmm. stage this next step mm -hmm. with the kind of structures and uh, economic role of the state 
that they are trying to mm -hmm. use here. So we'll see. And I, I'm really agnostic. I'm not trying to say either way. I, it's an interesting experiment, mm. and we'll see what, what will come out of it. Yes. But it's not been the root of Japan, nor the root of mm. Korea, not the mm. root of Taiwan. Mm. States where the state was important, but not in the same mm. way as in China. Well, when you really think about relationship between the growth, development, economic development, political development, such a mind-boggling question. Mm. Yes. Uh, one common picture, not only frequently used by scholars, but even politicians, is the you know, satellite map, which is showing globe and in the night, where you can see the bright line. And stark contrast is the Korean Peninsula. You see South and North. Yes. And so it looks like South Korea is, uh, is not connected by North Korea light looks like abandoned island, but there is quite open areas, you know, the, uh, the cover. So on that basis, people try to argue, you know, because they have two different institutions, they, uh, you know, the result to this kind of outcome, but that something debatable. So on that uh, extension, perhaps we can talk a little bit about global culture, which is very much debated in mm. this part of the world, because, you know, that discussion is of Asian culture. Yes. You know, the uh, late uh, the premier, the Rikam Yo, he uh, strongly claimed the reason why Asia become very much prosperous, you know, Asian, Asian value, yes. emphasizing hard work, diligence. But many, many people become very much critical, even some Asians become very critical. This yes. kind of pretext to a lot of authoritarian leadership. Yes. So, well, so, so I, I, I take again an institutional mm -hmm. view on it, yeah. you know, um, culture, what is culture is, is essentially a set of values and norms mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that people abide to. Uh, me as a microeconomist, you know, uh, values and norms mm -hmm. are typical shortcuts mm -hmm. to help to govern our behaviors. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we have different societies as evol have evolved to have somewhat different norms and values mm -hmm to as shortcuts to allow economic transactions, to allow personal transactions, to allow transactions between the citizen and the state and so on to happen. Mm -hmm. Religion has a set of values and norms in it that will help to or hinder certain behaviors to take place. So, so there is obviously differences in cultural background. Um, the important thing is, is that how do these values and norms evolve when societies develop? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, trust is one of these areas mm -hmm. where obviously we know from history people have emphasized economic transactions go become easier if you can trust mm -hmm. the people to do it because you don't have to work at the details of contracts. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there's other parts as well. For example, values such as integrity. Mm -hmm. Integrity is another part of it, and one thing that I know, and this is me talking as a British civil servant, mm -hmm. something me coming from a university working as a British civil servant, mm -hmm. is that actually there's a certain set of values mm -hmm. that a civil service, mm -hmm. the bureaucracy can have. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that actually not everybody needs to test and check whether you're actually putting money in your own pockets, mm -hmm. but actually work for the interest of the state mm -hmm. which you're serving. Mm -hmm. So values matter because they're shortcuts mm -hmm and they, they save in mm -hmm. costs and they allow all kinds of things to mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. so, so values such as trust and integrity matter. Mm -hmm. Work ethic may matter as well. The commitment to, to do a good job without having to be monitored. Mm -hmm. Now, the big question is, mm -hmm. how do they evolve mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. societies evolve? Yes. We all are interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. We've seen societies that were quite corrupt mm -hmm. to become having to develop much more integrity. Mm -hmm where you have seen societies where integrity was valued, mm -hmm. that actually appear to be seeing more corrupt behavior. Mm -hmm. So the question is not as if these values and these norms are totally constant, to put it differently, That's that right. culture is exactly the mm -hmm. same. Mm -hmm. the, the whole challenge mm -hmm. is how it evolves. Mm -hmm. We have seen in this country, in China, where we are today, to, uh, to have a concern with issues to do with corruption. Mm -hmm. We've seen in African societies, I know in Ethiopia where when I first started working, most people had very limited concept of ideas of corruption. They were mm -hmm. asking us co questions about mm -hmm. what did that mean. It wasn't really prevalent, mm -hmm. where maybe now there is more pressures mm -hmm. that some of these things happen. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, it's the change that matters. Mm -hmm. And the question you should ask is how does Korea, Japan, China, the whole, all the countries in East Asia, mm -hmm. how are they changing when change is occurring in their mm -hmm. societies? Is this for the better or not? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's fixed. Mm -hmm. But it matters. Mm -hmm. It is really important. Go back to Africa. I think it's really important in some of the countries we work in to start building up bureaucracies again where integrity is much more valued where motivation to do a good job is, is valued. And that is not just about paying good salaries. Mm -hmm. The Singapore solution is not necessarily yeah. the only solution that we can have. Can exactly. So, you know, and paying massive mm -hmm. salaries for your top people, well, maybe it worked in Singapore at that thing. I don't know what it will mean in 100 years in Singapore mm -hmm. and what how it changes. And the same mm -hmm. applies to all countries. Mm -hmm. Culture matters. Mm -hmm. Values and norms matter. Mm -hmm. But be aware that they change. Anyone says there is something like constant Asian values, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's too much change mm -hmm. in Asia to mm -hmm. simply say everything will mm -hmm. remain the same. Yeah, you mentioned the evolution of value system. Uh, According to my experience, when I was a small kid, uh, when Korea was very poor, we on receiving the A's, and our school meal was provided by these, you know, the A's, what we call those days. Uh, we had expression like Korean time. Korean time means we're supposed to meet uh, 4 a.m. for interview. Yes. But, you know, people, they never show up until 4.30. Okay. I see. And the excuse is, there was no traffic jam, right, those days? Right. So, I was late because of traffic jam. No, nothing like that. People didn't appreciate the value of time. Yes. But even before I could recognize, no expression about Korean time. Yes. Every meaning start on time. Right. But there was no peer pressure. Yes. Simply they do it. Uh, idea is very simple because the economy is going to very much prosper. People try to appreciate value their own time and others' time. Yes. So that's something quite, you know, the yep. rapidly evolving. For instance, the Korean concept of Bali uh, Bali doing quick quick, because a lot of Koreans make investment in China. There's a cultural clash because Chinese people, their attitudes heaven can wait, like you know, manmandi is slow slow. So when in, whenever Korean the construction companies are making big construction semiconductor completion in part of Xi'an by Samsung Electronics, the biggest investment. But uh, Samsung want to complete within one year. But Chinese workers in past for three years. Yes. And then, uh, so in that case, uh, there, there's a clash. Yes. And I don't see, you know, we have any early sign of Chinese this you know, intrinsic value, I which see. is dating back to a long time. Changing. Changing. I see. So uh, in that regard, you know, a lot of Chinese people saying that well, material well-being stability, what matters. Yes. That means if this is the case, then uh, you know, China can keep moving with a strong government, but not much you know, political development. Maybe, but, but it's an interesting example. Mm -hmm. If we go back to middle income trap, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that China clearly needs to do is mm -hmm. increase its productivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you know, the timekeeping and so on mm -hmm is not there. That is one in a, f in a firm, time becomes money. That's one way. Labor productivity increases if, if everybody does their tasks exactly on time and so on. Mm -hmm. And so if you, st there are things that probably will need to change mm -hmm. to be able to be, to increase that, that productivity mm -hmm. of, the, of the workers. So I would be very surprised that it's not slowly changing mm -hmm. and that, that things are, are evolving. And mm -hmm. Yes, and maybe there is something that what you say, it may go slowly mm -hmm. and of course in a big country there's, there is less pressure from outside. Mm -hmm. So as a result it can last longer. Big cult countries usually have a much more homogenous culture uh, in, in, in when, when they're stable. You know, American culture is also quite similar across America. It's mm -hmm. a big place while in Europe lots of small differences because very small countries mm -hmm. next to each other. Mm -hmm. So things evolve mm -hmm. and, and we'll see, mm -hmm. we'll see. But um, I, I will definitely don't want, I don't want to deny mm -hmm. that um, there will always be clear, clear differences. 
Mm -hmm. So there may still be Asian values, although mm -hmm. I think they will evolve. Mm -hmm. They will be somewhat different and it will manifest mm -hmm. themselves differently. And whether that will always be to the benefit, mm -hmm. uh, to the economic benefit, mm -hmm. it's not always clear. Mm -hmm. There's certain Western values that mm -hmm. help the West having high productivity, mm -hmm. there's some other Western values, mm -hmm. it's consumerism and mm -hmm. so on, that probably doesn't help its economies to develop mm -hmm. uh, very well. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can change the gear to India, because okay. people are saying that the uh, biggest story in the second half of 20th century is China, then people are saying the biggest story, biggest you know, story to come, 21st century is India. So two countries account for more than 30, 40 percent of the entire mm -hmm. populations. And whenever we introduce India, the largest country practicing democracy. Yes. And also such a contrast that China is focusing manufacturing. India used to focus on so, so, so. IT, but you know, Modi tried to change it. And as economists who study India for a long time, how do you see you know, the turn around India, the process? and future prospect. So, so India and China, this, there, are interest, there are certain parallels in the big picture of, of the growth story. Both countries used to underperform and it's China that started doing a lot of the catch-up earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's not necessarily by totally n innovating, it's by a lot of copying and a lot of responding to, to the opportunities that there are. Mm -hmm. I think India, there used to be an expression which was the Hindu growth rate. Yeah, which Hindu is very one percent. Uh, yes, to, uh, yeah. and for a long time. Yeah. But it also suggests there was a lot of repressed growth. Mm -hmm. And since the first liberalizations in the early 1990s, mm -hmm it's actually started to grow quite fast mm -hmm. and beginning this catch-up. So fundamentally there's a lot of opportunity still in India and in fact people sometimes forget is the huge differences between the different states in India as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know Maharashtra or mm -hmm. Tamil Nadu or Kerala mm -hmm. are places with um, with industries, with, uh, with its services or even manufacturing industries that are, you know, really highly competitive mm -hmm. industries. You know, it's maybe, it's, it's not as homogenous as mm -hmm. it was in China and the, in, uh, on, mm -hmm. on the coast, but, but it is, there, there are definitely states mm -hmm. where there's been big pockets of, mm -hmm. of big growth for, for quite mm -hmm. a long time. I think just as it happened with China, it's mm -hmm. a big country, it takes a long time for all the parts of the mm. countries to start catching up. Mm. And you know, a lot of, of growth in China mm. has long been the catching up mm. of other, of the people, people moving to where the jobs are, and the catch up mm. of the other regions. Mm. I think that's a lot still uh, possible mm. in India, mm. even if not that much changes. Mm -hmm. So I should say, even without much change, mm. India will actually keep on growing quite, quite mm. fast. But there's definitely massive opportunities, uh, whether it's uh, Modi or or uh, or is it the state governments in the different uh, subs in mm -hmm. the different states in the country mm -hmm. that need to do things? But there's a lot of opportunity still mm -hmm. to get that growth mm -hmm. accelerated. It is true that their industrial base is relatively weak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also not always clear that at this moment the smart move of India would be to try to be. The, the workshop of Asia in the yeah. way, the same mm -hmm. way that, that, that China mm -hmm. has become mm -hmm. the workshop mm -hmm. of Asia. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. you know, wages are still quite low. Mm -hmm. um, and you have at the same time lots of engineers, lots of skilled workers. Mm -hmm. I do think in India the problem is, has long been much more institutional. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an economy where free ideas flow free, freely. The state mm -hmm. has, is not controlling the, mm -hmm. the sectors. There's a lot of private initiative, private investment. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of regulation and a mm -hmm. lot of red tape mm -hmm. and there's a lot of restrictions mm -hmm. on foreign capital coming mm -hmm. in and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think India could do well mm -hmm. if it really wants to grow faster still mm -hmm. to keep on reforming its economy mm -hmm. and be less inward looking. Mm -hmm. India is actually a surprisingly inward looking mm -hmm. economy still. Mm -hmm. It's not quite mm -hmm. really going out mm -hmm. there to compete with the rest of the world. It hasn't mm -hmm. quite learned from East Asia mm -hmm. that actually that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. It likes to, s to keep itself mm -hmm. closed. But um, I think, uh, you know, if we were to say, you know, which one will be the fastest the growing economy in the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. I think, I'm not sure it's going to be China or India. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's probably, it may well be India. Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. actually, but it could also be that India mm -hmm. um, 
maybe a little bit to do with its politics and its and its and its very poor regulation and the state not playing a very good role. Um, maybe it is actually it could do far worse than China. Mm -hmm. I think the, it could be either way. Either mm -hmm. either will India will do far better than China, or it actually could mm -hmm. could do far worse. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see. Mm -hmm. Wait and see there as well. But the opportunities are there. As an investor, mm -hmm. you would look very carefully at India at the moment. Many viewers of this conversation uh, might be some high school kids mm. or college kids who want to practice something like you or study develop economics. So could you offer some advice to those future leaders? Right. So I suppose um, for those who are interested in the world, I think economics is first of all a very good area to come because with the rise of Asia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's the economy that will drive also the story of Asia in the world. And I think that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. But um, I hope that those who listen to this and watch this are not just thinking that the only way to be useful in society is to actually join a firm and make a lot of money. I think there's a, a lot to be gained from keeping an open mind and having a big view of the world. You know, the world is a fascinating place. What's happening in Asia, putting it in the context, learning the history of Asia, but also where it all could go. I think there's probably nothing more fascinating at the moment to study. So lots of economists of the futures, I hope, future leaders that will understand economics, but I, I hope they'll learn about history and they'll learn also to think very carefully about politics, how politics and economics interact because Every investor mm -hmm. will have to think very carefully, will I put my money in a particular place? And they have to think very carefully about it. When in 10 years I want to make a profit on this, what will this country look mm -hmm. like? So having a long view and mm -hmm. understanding the politics mm -hmm. and learning from history, that would be mm -hmm. my advice mm -hmm. uh, if you want to be a good economist for the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's very prudent that's advice because uh, these days students they tend to be very much a functional and parochial. So students study economics, they tend to less regard anything other than economics. Students studying political science, they tend to pay real attention to economics being so technical and so on. Yes. So we need to, that there's an integration also historic perspective because history really what happened, right? Yes. Well, perhaps we can close by asking the one question which is happening in front of us. 21st century global community, they pay the collective interest in poverty reduction. So Millennium Development Goal is one thing, but uh, 15 years of trial is gone. Now, the happened to be the Korean the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. He is coming up with some, you know, the, the new idea, but the same intention, like sustainable development. Uh, but if I'm right, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, sustainable idea has been long been a UK or British idea in intellectual community. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so how do you assess this you know, sustainable development goal until 2030? Yes. Uh, some people saying that there is long ideas, but details, uh, so many indicators, so many investigations. There's a you know, these are targets, these are goals, these are the things that we want to look at. You know, The way I look at it is um, when we had the Millennium Development Goals, they were largely about income poverty and health indicators and a little bit of education. Mm -hmm. they, reduced, they reduced societies to the performers on basic needs, mm -hmm. which I think is not bad. But a great attraction mm -hmm. of working on the Sustainable Development Goals is that they are now actually mm -hmm. not just talking about what's happening to the poor, but also understanding what's happening to the poor and to, the, in fact, the citizens of the world everywhere has also to do with economics. Mm -hmm. There are things to do with economics in there. Mm -hmm. People talk about jobs. People talk about economic opportunities. Mm -hmm. The, the, the Sustainable Development Goals talk about politics, they talk about accountability, they talk about voice, and they talk about environment, and they talk about the sustainability of the planet. 
And it's really interesting that it talks about you know, things to do with people, things to do with politics, things to do with the economic uh, uh, circumstances, mm -hmm. things to do with the planet. Mm -hmm. What's really good, it forces us to have a big view of the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. A big view of the world that we are all interdependent and that we actually are better think very carefully about this. Of course, it's a bit vague. These are vague goals. And I think what's really the challenge, and it's a really difficult challenge which we haven't resolved, is to think through what does it mean then for strategies. Mm -hmm. So what do you then do? Mm. The MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, were quite easy. The strategy was, it seems, or just focus on these particular areas. Mm -hmm. Now we have to have much more integrated strategies. Mm -hmm. But that's perfectly good for the 21st century. Because what's happening in China matters for Africa. What's happening with the poor in China actually somehow will have lessons for the poor in Africa. What's happening with Korea or Brazil has lessons mm -hmm. for Europe and so on. Mm -hmm. And we're all interdependent. Mm -hmm. But we better think very carefully about and working maybe more than before on how do we actually get there? How do we have a good strategy that is actually really delivering for people, not just in the short run, but also in the long run? So if analogy is millennium development goal is something like solving partial equilibrium condition, this is like you know, solving general equilibrium conditions. I, I think that's not a bad way of putting uh -huh. it. Uh -huh. It's really solving the interdependencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, as you know, general equilibrium needs some theories, needs some much better thinking right, yes. of how to achieve it. Yeah. Partial equilibrium, you can mm -hmm. just do an income transfer yeah, and something quick. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And this is mm -hmm. a bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting and we'll need to learn from lots of experiences from across the world. And, mm -hmm. um, and I hope, and that's my hope with the Sustainable Development Goals, that we don't reduce it simply to a few vague things mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. there but actually that we have amongst all countries and intellectuals of different mm -hmm. countries real debates about and how shall we now do this mm -hmm. and what do we all need to mm -hmm. do and what is our different roles mm -hmm. and how does aid relate to things that are not to do with aid how does it relate to trade policy how does it relate to environmental mm -hmm. policy and so on and mm -hmm. so on much harder mm -hmm. but I think much more interesting some years ago I met Mohammed Yunus he was actually awarded the Seoul Peace Prize, but the day he was arriving in China Airport, he just announced as collecting Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in the, the public uh, uh, talk sessions, uh, so much people are storming in. And he talked something quite, you know, the memorable. He was actually economist, as you know, that he yes. was teaching in the U.S., but somehow he was appalled by what has happened in his home country, and he, the, he decided to go back to his country, start with something. So obviously, you know, you've been leading the intellectual community in fight against reduction of poverty. Perhaps, you know, the, we should be successful, and we have to have a collective spirit. So sometime, hopefully soon, not late, globe shouldn't be any further poverty and we can move on to the next stage. Yes. So Dr. Delco, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you very much. Well thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Very good.